elected and appointed offices throughout the country. We know we need equitable representation in elected offices and increasing native representation in office is crucial to seeing a reflective democracy for all Americans. One in which the country benefits from leadership and talents of native peoples and is responsive to the assets and issues of native citizens. Historically, legal and contemporary factors affect the level and depth of engagement of Native Americans, especially Native women, in political systems contributing to a drastic underrepresentation of Indigenous peoples as elected leaders and at every level of government. According to the 2020 U.S. Census data, in our own research, Native American, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian peoples have made up about 0.3% of elected officials, whereas we represent at least 3.4% of the total U.S. population. In order to reach representation parity in elected offices alone, we need to elect more than 17,000 Indigenous leaders at all levels of government, out of 520,000 elected officials nationwide. Investment in increasing Native American representation in elected office is a crucial endeavor for securing a reflective democracy for all Americans, one in which the country benefits from the leadership and talents of Native peoples and is responsive to the assets and issues of Native citizens. So now we'll get into our special guest today. Today we have Jordan Oglesby, who is a citizen of the Navajo Nation from Shiprock, New Mexico. She is a graduate of the University of New Mexico and has earned her law degree from UNM School of Law as a Navajo Law Fellow, where she also received her Indian Law Certificate. Jordan is alumni of PLSI, uh, 2017 TA 2018 and Emerge New Mexico 2021. She's currently served as serves as an a, associate counsel for Pueblo of Eslada and currently serves as an attorney for Economic and Community Development Unit within the Navajo Nation Department of Justice. She's licensed to practice law in Navajo Nation, New Mexico, and the U.S. District Court for New Mexico. Jordan is the chair elect of the Indian Law uh, section of the State Bar of New Mexico. Thank you, Jordan, for being here today and welcome so much to our Facebook Live. Uh, so we'll just hop on into the first question. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey into the field of law? Um, you know, what's it like to be a young Deneb woman in law? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Christina. Uh, let me just start off by saying I'm happy to speak with you tonight in my individual capacity. And I just want to uh, preface by saying that um, my views are my own and don't represent that of my current employer or affiliated organizations. But yeah, let's get right into it. Um, you know, the the path for me to where I am today, it's, it's really been a long one. Um, I did go straight into law school from undergrad, um, but really it started when I was younger, just growing up on the Navajo Nation. I grew up uh, splitting my time between Shiprock, New Mexico and Albuquerque, New Mexico. And just being on Navajo, I was really interested in how you could really create or contribute to the Navajo economy. And so when I went into undergrad, I was interested in you know learning more about business, in high school, I didn't really know much about um, just Native American anything. So how I got to law was really pursuing a minor in Native American studies at the University of New Mexico. And it was through that amazing program, some great professors that I was able to be you know, exposed to federal Indian law or really just a, a little little part of it. And from there, um, I was interested in going into University of New Mexico School of Law and also participated, like you said in my bio earlier, uh, the Pre-Law Summer Institute. So it's really just a combination of things through my own interests, um, taking advantage of opportunities at UNM that led me to where I am today. That's great. And for the audience, actually, Jordan and I met three years ago, was it, at the... <laughs> advance um no was it native american political leadership in washington dc we were roommates um and you know it, it was an amazing experience i remember you talking about economics um and having an interest in that and that's not really i would say one of the most popular topics but i found it captivating because um you know every time we go back to our reservations our home um 
I always just see a lot of potential in it. Um, so it's really great that that you're in this capacity now and just doing so much. Thanks, Christina. Yes. <laughs> and all right, let's go to our second question. Um, and anyone else uh, comments in the chat too? That's always great. Uh, we have folks monitoring that. So second question, um, how did you first get involved in politics? Um, I think it's quite interesting, you know, not directly be involved in politics, um, but, you know, folks might, you know, have a job that doesn't directly maybe be in the line of politics, but, um, you know, like getting involved, um, you know, for me when I was in grad school, um, I registered people to vote and, you know, that wasn't a part of my grad school program or line of work, but I'm just curious to know, how did you first get involved in politics? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. It really takes me back. Um, I would say probably began just being at UNM. One of the great things about voting in New Mexico is that they always had a voting center at the university. So seeing that going to class every day um, really got me interested in, you know, what what were elections like? When do I need to vote? What's on, uh, you know, the ballot? So that's when I first got introduced to politics and seeing the local politics at like the city and state level. And then from there, um, really just educating myself because like you said before, we've grown up on the Navajo Nation and um, also being responsible, or at least I consider myself being responsible as a dual citizen. Like how how do I register to vote on the Navajo Nation? So I would say um, my interest in politics really just came from curiosity about what the different systems of representation were and like you said, like I wasn't directly involved in anything in particular. It was really about that self-education at first. And then when I got to law school, you know, you learn a little bit about um, the, the legal system, political system. It was my involvement in the National Native American Law Students Association. Um, I would say also furthered my interest in politics because I ran to be on the executive board um, being uh, an executive board member and just, you know, telling law students about sort of the resources as, as Native law students. Um, and that led me to sort of some more uh, voting work when I did end up working for the Navajo Nation Department of Justice later. I'd also add that, you know, I sat and thought about it the other day and I was like, when was the first time you know, I got involved in politics and I don't know if you remember the Navajo Nation scholarships. Yeah, um, I, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember if it was that that asked us like for your voter registration card. That's right. No, that's a good reminder, Christine. Yeah, because again, you're like, okay, what chapter am I registered at? You know, trying to learn like on the Navajo side, who is running for office this year? And does this person run now or do they run like during the next election cycle? Yeah, and I grew up off the reservation. So that was a um, interesting journey in itself because um, I'm not familiar with a lot of tribal election offices who have moved digitally. Um, but, you know, Navajo Nation, it's good all in person um, <laughs> and then making sure you have your voter card and you don't get your voter ID purged um, and, you know, which chapter to go with your mom or your dad. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then can you explain a little bit more? You mentioned about that dual citizenship. I always identify as that as well. Um, you know, we're both Navajo Nation citizens, but also U.S. citizens, um, and even, you know, living in our state as well. Can you explain a little bit more about that for the public? Yeah, sure. So when I say dual citizenship, I'm talking about my political affiliation as a citizen of the Navajo Nation, as well as being a United States citizen. Um, there's a long history um, for Navajo Nation and many other tribal nations about gaining the right to vote. You know, it took a lot of litigation and advocacy, both by individual members 
and uh, tribal nations to ensure our right to vote. So I know that a lot of people do have strong feelings about participating in either or both political systems. But speaking personally for me, I've always found it important to really educate myself because I know that my vote, my vote is my voice and my voice really matters, especially as a young person and also just, you know, as, as a young Navajo woman, like um, it's, you really have to push to get your voice out there and speak on important matters. And that's one way I make my voice count is uh, casting my vote in both the Navajo and state elections. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, definitely a concept that maybe not a lot of folks have uh, been aware of. Um, so to the third question, you know, do you have any advice for folks who are wanting to get involved in politics? Uh, maybe are there some easy ways that you might volunteer? Sure, yeah. Um, I would say, you know, there's always opportunities to volunteer, whether it's one party the other or the other at the state level. Um, but also just, you know, showing up to meetings or calling into meetings just to give both examples. Like if a city council has a meeting and you don't really know what's uh, being talked about, I think one of the positive aspects about um, being in this time of COVID is that a lot of times, uh, a lot of these meetings are online and broadcasted, which they weren't normally as accessible. So really just um, making sure you're educated on the topics at hand and, you know, just asking around, like uh, you would be surprised how many people are involved in politics and um, are running for office. So just asking, um, especially in states like New Mexico and Arizona, there's plenty of opportunities to, uh, even if you're not comfortable maybe yet getting behind a candidate, uh, you can also reach out to um, help people get registered to vote. Like you were talking about earlier, Christina, just, you know, that's one way to get involved, I think. Definitely on um, issue as well. You know, we have our tribal elections, but we also have, you know, maybe your county officials or maybe you live off the reservation, you have your city officials. Um, and maybe you have a passion in economics um, and wanting to build maybe more indigenous businesses or BIPOC businesses. Each of the levels of government, um, you know, have a place of, of that power that they can uh, create solutions to. Um, and Jordan's right, you know, ask around, um, ask questions. And, you know, in my opinion, public officials should be easily accessible. Um, just sending them an email um, or a phone call to the office um, and even just asking, you know, do you, what do you think about this issue and go from there? I know I'm lucky enough to have my local elected officials. Um, I can just email them if they want to grab coffee and just talk. So yes, good, good recommendations. Um, okay, so question number four. Have you thought about running for office? Um, and if yes, what positions are you interested in? Sure. Yes, I, I've definitely thought about running for office. Um, I participated in the New Mexico Emerge program, um, and that was a helpful program to sort of gear up uh, Democratic women in uh, training on how to run for office. So I have thought about it. I know that there's, you know, that saying out there that a woman has to be asked seven, probably more than that times before they actually seriously consider running. So I've thought about it. Um, I think originally I had felt very passionately about running for tribal office, but more recently, I think um, there's a lot of power I think in running for local office. So um, I think in the future, I would like to run for Albuquerque City Council. I really love Albuquerque and being in this area. So a local office like that is something I'd be interested in running for in the future. 
That's exciting. Um, I'm so glad to hear that. And this is a great time to plug that. At advance, we do have the Native American Leadership Institute training um, that I'm definitely, Jordan, you would be perfect for that. Um, it's great because it's Indigenous folks who are interested in running for office in the next one to three years. And, um, you know, you don't really have to know exactly which position you want to run for, um, but something like local city council is absolutely perfect. Um, and so create so much change um, to your everyday life in comparison to running for Congress. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, we'll probably drop a link here during this live for folks who want to apply um, or nominate folks. Uh, we'll be having monthly trainings. Um, they're four day virtual trainings and you are surrounded by indigenous powerful folks um, who are as, you know, wanting to create change in our community. So I'm so glad to hear about that. Um, can't wait for you to announce your campaign you know, whenever that is. Um, and let's see. So going on to, um, oh, so because you have a law background, have you ever thought about wanting to be a judge or like the judicial branch, things of politics? Um, you know, I've always... Uh, I'm embarrassed to say as a state lawmaker, you know, I really didn't know much about what goes on on that side, <laughs> but someone explained it to me that as a legislator on the legislative side, you make the laws on the judic judicial side, they interpret the laws. So make sure that when you're making them, you make them so when they get interpreted on this end, that it's pretty clear. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think. Um, I am definitely interested in it. I think it's also intimidating because honestly, when I was growing up, um, I didn't really know native attorneys or native lawyers. So now to think forward and to see other native attorneys who do go on to become judges, whether at the state level or the federal level, it's extremely important to have that representation. And I know there are a lot of organizations out there that are really promoting, encouraging people to consider that in the future, because like on you know the political side, representation at the state, federal, any level really, uh, the same goes for the ju judicial. Like we need more native judges um, at every level. So, um, I have thought about it. It'd be interesting to, you know, I'm, I'm still such a young attorney, but something to look forward to in the future. And I think it's it's really, really important to have that representation because, you know, ultimately one day we we are we we already need uh, a Native American judge on the, the Supreme Court. So I think every new judge um, that is Native American, uh, when they get into that seat, it, it gets us one step closer to having that representation um, uh, on the Supreme Court of the United States. And um, I believe in Arizona, we'll be having three Indigenous women judges, um, Representative Jennifer Germain, I believe, um, and uh, several others. And I was just talking about how that's important with missing more indigenous peoples. Um, and, you know, of course we want folks to run for office, but also on that, that end, we need folks to prosecute and to know Indian law. We've seen at SCOTUS, the Supreme Court level, how um, that goes with uh, Indian law. So yes, good points. Um, so the next question, in your experience as an uh, attorney or a person work, who works in law, um, you know, who's involved in civic engagement? What's the need like for Indigenous folks to be involved um, in civic engagement or in politics? There's definitely a very crucial need to have more Native involvement. You know, even, even if you're not thinking about running for office, doing the sort of behind the scenes work when it comes to assisting with campaigns, because if you think about it, like even in a state like New Mexico, there really isn't that expertise about how to promote or to get the word out about certain candidates um, on tribal nations. And you need those resident experts. You need Native American people who can tell campaigns or can tell others like, hey, this is how you get the word out. This is how you inform members of the public. 
Um, you really need to show up to chapter meetings, like information like that is really crucial, not only, you know, to assist uh, certain candidates, but to inform the public everywhere that these are the candidates, these are their issues when it comes to engaging with tribal nations and, you know, even helping the campaign come up with the, the platform, because um, as we saw in 2020 and 2022, um, in a big state like Arizona, um, the native vote really made a difference in that election. I would agree too, because there's just a different approach. I believe um, with working with indigenous communities, especially something as Western as politics, or the Western politics that we um, face with, uh, you know, there's, and there's so much distrust within the indigenous community um that you know kind of the thought of you know we can serve our communities as well um what comes to my mind um you know when i talk about the first time i got civically engaged was registering folks to vote um the other volunteers you know we were doing this in a um a community that's low income and um you know bipoc folks and the volunteers who were volunteering to register voters were non bipoc folks so just having people from that community um giving them the tools or training them uh to serve their own community just just goes a long way um yeah i, I mean even in politics our campaign or an office side too um there's just such a big need for indigenous folks to to be in these spaces. Definitely, I I totally agree, Christina. And would encourage a lot of people to consider it. And you know, like like you said, you don't have to be on the campaign team to volunteer with candidates. You can also volunteer like the day of or day before to get the word out. Definitely. Um. So to the next question. Um, can you tell us about any accomplishments that you were a part of or witness as a, an Indigenous person involved in civic engagement? You mentioned the big in Arizona victory where the Native vote was such a big powerhouse. Um, yeah, were you, were you involved in that? Let's see, let me think of a specific example. It's really, it's always a team effort. So I will say um, that um, I volunteered in Arizona in 2020 um, through the Native Vote uh, Project through the ASU Indian Law Clinic. And so for me, it was really important to me to be there on election day, to be just a, a not really, I don't, I want to make sure I'm right about the terminology for it, but just a volunteer. And if anybody had any questions after they came out and cast their vote, if there were any hiccups when it came to um, that election day that I was there to assist and provide that help that, you know, isn't always given on tribal nations. So it's a really great project over at the ASU Indian Law Clinic. And also just, you know, in my previous experience working for the Navajo Nation Department of Justice, just making sure or just assisting in the coordination um, when it comes to state elections. Um, personally, uh, I found it very helpful to just answer questions, just to make sure people knew when election date was or where their uh, polling location was, uh, was very important to me because with people living on tribal nations, sometimes they don't have a lot of resources. So if it's easier for them to just call and ask a question and I'm able to, you know, look up that information, um, then I'm happy to help uh, in those little ways, which to me were very important. I think those are especially important during, um, you know, the last week of elections, um, you know, we can get so many mail, uh, word of vote and all that, but when it comes to the day of and life gets in the way, it's just like, oh, like where's my polling location or, you know, where do I drop off my ballot? Um, no, I think I think it's really great to hear that. I, I think you might've been a poll watcher. Um, 
<laughs> so a lot of that is voluntary positions as well. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes in voting lines, um, there could be some hiccups. Um, so sometimes you might need that support to report it. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for for volunteering. It sounds like, you know, your um, academic institutions were a big part in it. So if you're a college student um, or a student still in education, um, sounds like, you know, there's a lot of great resources there. Um, and, you know, yeah, welcome to get involved. Um, so we're going to go into a lightning round of questions. Um, so what's on your most played music playlist right now? Oh my gosh. Okay, I have to cheat and look really quick because my <laughs> um, music is all over the place. Christina, for sure. Might as well pull up your Spotify. I know, I have to. <laughs> Let me pull up my Spotify raft. Um, right now I'm really into the 1975 that song I'm in love with you I just keep playing it over and over um but besides that I've probably just been re-listening to some old uh albums of the strokes but yeah that's what I'm listening to right now for music um I think my podcast listens are a little too embarrassing so I'll just keep it on songs <laughs> that's great because what's running through my head is like TikTok sounds all the time <laughs> I'm like, trying to learn the Brazilian dance battle. It's <laughs> um so what's your favorite Halloween candy? Ooh, I want to say Tootsie Rolls, but I honestly haven't had those in a long time. Um yeah, so those are my preferred. I don't know who still puts Tootsie Rolls in their little Halloween baskets. Um, but if not, then probably MMs for sure. I don't think that's a popular answer. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I would like to get Tootsie Rolls, but I think I just get uh, other candy. So, <laughs> oh, great. Um, and then, last question: uh, What's the last movie you saw, or what are you most excited to see that's coming out soon? Um, let's see. The last one I saw, of course. Black Panther, the indigenous representation coming up. I, you know, I really haven't seen anything good coming out lately. So if anyone has good movie recommendations coming out, yeah, send them my way. I saw Black Panther too, and it was, it was really great to see that indigenous culture. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for being on our Facebook Live today. Um, I think it's just amazing to see how far we came in three years, um, but just to hear all your ambitions and all the great work that you've done and will continue to do. Um, and then again, we have our, um, you know, Native Leadership Institute training for everybody who is interested um, and wanting to run for office or wanting to get involved. Um, you do have to be Indigenous, um, but we'll be having those monthly in 2023. Um, so feel free to apply or nominate folks um, and feel free to go to our website to learn more about advanced Native American political leadership. Thank you so much, Jordan, for being with us tonight and everyone else have a great day.